Hi, I'm Emma. I'm a mathematician, and I think math is magical. Maybe you're not surprised to hear that I love math. You might be a little bit more surprised to hear that I find it creative, exploratory, and overwhelmingly human. Mathematicians throughout the ages have called math the music of reason, the poetry of the universe. They say lofty things like mathematics is the most beautiful and most powerful creation of the human spirit. Mathematicians can make doing math sound like a magical quest of mythic proportions. My friends and family, not so much. They tend to call math torture. <laughs> they say things like, Ew, I hate math, and what's the point? I'm never going to use this. Or, Emma, it's not too late to go to medical school. <laughs> it is too late. It's too late, my friends. I have fallen head over heels for math, and you can too. Some of my friends and family struggle with math anxiety. When interacting with math, they feel an overwhelming sense of dread. They start sweating. Their heart rate increases. Though there are a lot of misleading statistics out there, it's clear that math anxiety is prevalent among people of all ages. We know it can easily be passed on from teacher or parent to student, and a worrying portion of those who are studying to be teachers report feeling anxiety around math themselves. Students with math anxiety often detach from math classes to distance themselves from the source of anxiety, causing them to struggle even further as their education progresses, generating ever more math anxiety. But even many of those who don't have math anxiety feel detached from math, a subject they see as rote and boring. For the past few years, I've been working on a series of projects to help all students experience the magic of mathematics through tabletop role-playing games. A tabletop role-playing game, like Dungeons & Dragons, for example, is an open-ended collaborative game. Players begin by agreeing on some set of rules and choosing characters to embody throughout gameplay. They then sit around a table with some pens, paper, maybe some dice, and explore and tackle challenges by verbally describing their character's actions. One player typically takes on a special role called Game Master or Dungeon Master. Like an MC, the dungeon master describes the fictional environments for the players and acts in the role of any non-player characters they might encounter. Importantly, it's the game master's responsibility to keep the narrative moving forward, allowing players the freedom to explore and make their own choices while making sure they don't get too far off track and steering them away from any catastrophic mistakes. Together, the players and the game master tell a story within the bounds of the fictional world. It's not always easy to explain what I do in my day-to-day -day as a mathematician, but our work is strikingly similar to playing a tabletop role-playing game. We pick rules to define the bounds of some world and then explore that world and ask questions, hoping the answers will lead us to new worlds and further exciting questions. As such, I found these games to be an excellent medium for allowing students to experience the act of doing mathematics, learning concepts through their own discoveries and explorations. The teacher in one of these games naturally takes on the role of game master, guiding students and allowing them elbow room to make mistakes and explore while keeping the thread of the class on track and helping move the narrative forward when necessary. So where does the math come in? Well, Naturally, many of these games involve counting dice rolls or calculating probabilities, or we could have our players say, encounter a character who can help them on their journey only if they say, solve this thinly veiled word problem. Those are okay, but we can go much deeper. I like to design the map of the world the players are exploring to mimic the structure of some mathematical object. Then, by simply exploring and navigating the world, the players are also inherently examining and internalizing the properties of said object. I designed one world which, unbeknownst to the players, was situated on a Mobius band, a strip with a half twist in it. The players soon discovered that simply by walking forward one cycle, they ended up upside down in the exact place they'd started. It turns out this surface only has one side, and it's an object which comes up all the time in my mathematical work. 
The role-playing component, while seemingly superfluous, may actually be an effective tool against math anxiety. Role-playing is a prominent tool in cognitive behavioral therapies to combat anxiety in general, allowing students to learn concepts through the lens of playing a character can provide a layer of separation between them and the mathematics, allowing them breathing room to make mistakes, not know the answers, and maybe see math from a new perspective. The role playing can also have pedagogical benefits. For example, in one game I designed, each character's personality and abilities mirrored a different role, a different field of mathematics and the tools it provides. Playing these characters can help students internalize classic mathematical tools, explore the variety of perspectives math has to offer, and understand how different fields of math work together to ans answer and ask different questions about similar objects, much like the sciences. So there are some of the whys and some of the hows, but it might still be difficult to imagine that mathematics and a fantasy adventure have much in common. The problem is, most people don't understand what it means to do math. In school, the rules, the questions, and even the general answers are all chosen for you. All you get to do is copy down and calculate specific cases of math done long ago. To borrow an analogy from mathematician Paul Lockhart, imagine if all you got to do in music class was copy down old Mozart scores, maybe filling in a missing note here and there if you're lucky. Or if art class was simply paint by numbers, Asking the questions and breaking the rules is what doing math is all about. Let me show you. This is you. You live on a world called Numberline. You walk around and everything seems pretty normal. You take one step forward and now you're one step from where you started. You take another step and now you're two steps from where you started and so on. This world was created with all the usual rules, the ones that are chosen for you for most of your time in school. But now it's time to really do math. We'll start slow. Take all the rules you're already familiar with and change just one thing. What if one plus one plus one equals zero? Whoa. That's crazy talk. Surely that's not allowed, right? We all know one plus one plus one equals three. Doesn't that break our world somehow? Well, there's only one way to find out. You take one step forward, and then another. So far, so good. Then you take one more. Suddenly, you're back where you started. Just as our rules dictate, one plus one plus one equals zero. Taking three steps is just the same as if you hadn't taken any steps at all. What if we take four steps? Well. You take one step, and then another, and then another, and then one more. Three steps took you back to where you started, and then there's one left over. So taking four steps is just the same as if you took one step. OK, what about five steps? Well, you, it's just the same as before. You take three steps to get you back to where you started, and then two more. So, one step is one step, and two steps is two steps, but three steps is zero steps, and four steps is one step, and five steps is two steps? What about seven steps? Well, you take three steps back where you started, another three steps back where you started again. You've taken six steps now, so there's one more. You take a step forward. So. One step is one step, but so are four steps and seven steps? I don't know about you, but I have so many more questions. Walking forward continuously, we land at zero, one, two, zero, one, two, zero, one, two. It's starting to seem like our world is less like a line and more like a circle? Living on a circle, imagine that. Well. It turns out we do live on a circle, a sphere, really. And though it may take a very, very long time, after some number of steps, you really will end up back where you started, if a little wet and dusty. Is this kind of thing, this weird new arithmetic we created, useful for anything else? Well, would you look at the time? 
Suppose last time I checked, it was 10 o'clock. If four hours have passed since then, it must be 10 plus four equals two o'clock? Circle arithmetic again. This time, 12 steps gets us back to where he started, or 24 if you're coming from out of town. Another example of this is a light switch. The light starts off, call that zero. If I flip the switch on, now, it, now that's one. If I flip the switch again, now it's back off, zero. This time, the number circle only has two points, zero and one. If I flip the switch five times, will the light be on or off? Well, I flip the switch twice, that leaves it off. I flip the switch twice again, it's still off. I flipped it four times, so I flip it once more. Now, the light is on. This kind of counting is crucial. Your computer, your phone, all of your devices are made up of billions of these on-off switches. There's so much more to explore here. But now let's rewind. Suppose if, instead of walking you through this story, I came in here and said, good morning, class. Open your textbooks to chapter three. Today we're going to learn about modular arithmetic. The following is an excerpt from a real undergraduate level math text. Given any two integers a and b, we can always find an integer we can always find an integer q such that a equals qb plus r, where r is an integer satisfying zero is less than or equal to r is less than the absolute value of b. As we know, the division algorithm tells us there are only b possible remainders when dividing by b. If we fix this divisor, we can group integers by the remainder. Each group is called a remainder class modulo b. Now, who can tell me what five modulo three is? Stuff of nightmares for most, I know. But you already know the answer to my question. The number after modulo refers to the size of the circle we're walking on, the number of steps which brings you back to where you started. So five modulo three asks the question, if three steps brings me back to where I started and I take five steps, how far have I traveled? Well, you tell me, all together now, don't be shy. Five modulo three is? Two. <laughs> That's right, <laughs> exactly. Five modulo three equals two. But the answer to that specific and not very expansive question is hardly the important part. Now that you've seen this exploration, you might have some ideas for how to extend this or apply it to similar problems or ask more questions and do more exploration. Now you're doing math. So. Telling you a story, walking you through how you yourself might have discovered some concept seems more effective and engaging than simply telling you the result. But what if we went further? What if instead of standing up here telling you a story, I let you pick the rules? What if I let you guide the questions, helped you make the discoveries? It can be hard to imagine what that might look like. That's where tabletop role playing games come in. We already have a slew of well-resourced frameworks for this kind of guided discovery, just waiting to help craft a mathematical adventure. Playing math-based tabletop role-playing games in a classroom or after school group or among adult friends can provide a fun and richly mathematical experience which eases math anxiety. But even just examining creative ideas like this one can get us thinking about all sorts of ways to improve math communication. There's no one way to do math, just as there's no one way to teach math or learn math or experience math. But the more we experiment with creative ideas and explore novel solutions, the more we break the rules and let the real exploratory math in, the better off we'll all be. As parents, teachers, students, people existing in the world, the most important thing we can do to ease the math anxiety epidemic is challenge our own ideas of what it means to do math and how we interact with it. When we say things like, I'm not a math person, or even just think it, we enforce the idea to ourselves and to the people around us that math is something only certain people can enjoy and succeed at. Then when someone who's already primed to think that way struggles with a concept in math, the only logical conclusion is that they are not a math person either and they detach, causing them to struggle even more, creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. If that person goes on to have students or children or even friends, they can easily pass that on and it quickly permeates. So what can you do? Well, first start, bring home what you learned today. 
Next time you're faced with a piece of math, don't be afraid to ask why, certainly. But also consider asking why not and what if. When someone gives you a rule, find out what happens if you break that rule. Here's another example to explore on your own or with your friends and family in addition to the circle arithmetic. You might have been told before that you cannot divide by zero. I challenge you to ask, why not? Find out what happens if you do divide by zero. Try and build a world where dividing by zero makes sense. Who knows what you might discover? Do some exploration. Make some discoveries. And allow yourself to have some fun with math. You might find it almost magical. Thank you very much.